The Cool Prince by Holly Black. Yes! Keep fighting people! Woo! Hello besties! Welcome or welcome back to my vlog channel. In today's vlog, we're going to be reading and talking about one of my favorite authors, Holly Black. If you're unfamiliar, Holly Black is the author of my favorite, favorite book series of all time, the Folk of the Air trilogy. And earlier this month, she actually released the first book in a spin-off duology in that same world. So in today's video, I'm going to be rereading The Cruel Prince, which is the first book in the original trilogy. And I'm going to be reading The Stolen Air, which is the new release in the duology. And if you thought that was all, you'd be wrong. I'm also going to be attending a Holly Black meet and greet in my city. Yeah. And I will be vlogging and I'll bring you along and it's just going to be a fabulous time. I am so, so excited. Initially, I wanted to reread the entire trilogy of The Folk of the Air before The Stolen Air came out, but I ended up not having enough time. So we're just going to be focusing on The Cruel Prince and The Stolen Air today. I will let you know now for The Cruel Prince reading the vlog, there will be spoilers. I will be talking about specific details and moments. So if you don't want to be spoiled for that, if you haven't read that series, definitely go read it. First of all, go buy it, go read it. You won't regret it. But also make sure you skip that portion of the vlog. Now for the Stolen Air reading vlog, I won't be giving spoilers since it is such a new release. So yeah, it'll be half spoiler, half spoiler free, if that makes sense. Of course, if there are any spoilers, I will definitely like mark it in the timestamps and put it on the screen, that kind of thing. But yeah, so we're gonna start off the vlog with the Cruel Prince reread, and then we'll jump into the Stolen Air read, and then we'll go to the book signing. And it's just gonna be such a fun time. I hope you enjoy. Prepare to see me do a lot of fangirling and overanalyzing of book characters and writing, and just prepare to see me have a fabulous time. And I hope you have a fabulous time watching. So without further ado, let's jump into The Cruel Prince reread. Okay, hello everyone. I have a bit of a reading update. I am on page 49. And as you can see by my tabbing, annotating is going very well. We are making serious progress. So as I'm editing this video, I realized that I never really went in depth into my tabbing system, my annotation colors, what they mean and why. So I thought I would just describe that for you here. So as you can see, the lime green tabs are my original high highlights from the first time that I read the book. Then we have blue for Cardin and his characterization, red for Jude and her characterization, and then purple for the scenes where they interact together or the romantic scenes between them. Then we have yellow, which is just my favorite little writing moments, stuff that I think is written very well, beautiful quotes, that kind of thing. Orange is any important plot information, any sort of like foreshadowing. Gray is just just anything I wanted to tab that deals with any other character besides Jude, Cardin, and Taryn because I actually did end up giving Taryn her own tab. It's like a light pink and it says I hate Taryn because I fucking hate Taryn. If you know, you know. <laughs> if you know, you know. And then lastly, we have dark green tabs for Fae food because I just love the way that Holly Black writes about the food that they eat in Elfheim and I just wanted to tab every moment because it, it was one of my favorite parts when I initially read the book. That's my color coding system. It's not perfect, but this is what we came up with and this is what we're working with. I also went to Michael's this morning and picked up some new annotating supplies. I just picked up this 30 pack of these fine liners that were highly recommended, Throne of Pages. I believe is who I got the recommendation from because they don't bleed through and they come in so many different colors. So I have coordinated them to match the tabs that I'm using. Initially, I was just using my Zebra Mild Liners, but these do kind of 
of bleed through if you go too heavy handed and they're a little bit too thick. I wanted something really fine to just underline. Hopefully from here on out, my annotations look a little bit cleaner because initially it looked like this and I just felt like that looked kind of messy. So as far as where we are at in the story, we've introduced pretty much all of the main characters. I thought it was hilarious how within the first page that we even meet Cardin, they begin talking about his tail and they allude to it even earlier in the book about how every one of the king's kids has like a unique feature about them. And I don't remember his tail being like so prevalent already, like right from the beginning. I know that's something that a lot of people complain about, but as Jude even says, I have nothing against tails. And I said, me either, Jude. And as I'm reading this, I'm really reflecting on some of the negative reviews that I've heard or seen online about this book. For this series, I'd say I could classify all of the negative reviews I've seen into three categories. There are three reasons why people tend not to like this book. First is that Cardin has a tail. And if that's your reason why you don't like this book, grow the fuck up. He's a fucking fairy. Like he's not a human. So like grow the fuck up, whatever, get over it. Two, people say that Cardin is just too mean and he's a bully and he's just toxic. And I just personally don't find that as a valid critique because the book is called The Cruel Prince. How are we going to be shocked when the prince is cruel? You know what I mean? Like, what's not clicking? I don't know. And third, I've heard people say that they just don't understand Jude as a character. Like they just don't understand why she's so hungry for power. And to that, I just feel like these people were not paying attention when they were reading. Even in the first 50 pages, Holly Black really makes it extremely clear what Jude's motivations are, why she feels this way, and just all the awful stuff that she's had to endure growing up in Elfame as a human and how that has shaped her into wanting to get revenge and wanting to make these fairy people pay for what they've done. And she wants to be better than them. She wants to beat them. She wants to spite them. She wants respect. And I just get it. I'm like, yes, absolutely. I love that for her. I feel like that's why I connected so much with Jude when I first read this series and why she is still like one of my favorite main characters ever. She understands that some of her feelings might not be necessarily like appropriate or positive, but she doesn't care. And I love that. I love a morally gray main character, especially a morally gray woman, because we don't really get to see that represented a lot in fiction, especially in fantasy stories. A lot of the times men are at the center of them. And I just really love that Jude, despite being mortal, despite having all the odds stacked against her, she does not give a fuck. And the way that she just starts dishing it back to Cardin and his friends, even though Cardin is literally a prince, he's super powerful. Every Everyone around Jude is like, what are you doing? Why are you like declaring war against this prince and his friends? You're basically signing a death wish, but Jude doesn't care. She even says to Taryn, the more they get away with, the more they believe they're entitled to have. And I fucking love that because it's true. The more that you allow people to belittle you and take advantage of you and hurt you, the more they will continue to do it. And you need to set boundaries. And sometimes in serious situations like this, you need to fight back. And I just, I love Jude so much. Holly Black just crafted such good characters in this book. In chapter six, I literally labeled it Jude's psyche val, where she goes and talks about like three stories from her past that kind of help explain why she is the way that she is. And just, there's so much in this first 50 pages that really helps you understand Jude's character. So for people that say that they don't like Jude or they don't understand why she's so power hungry, I just feel like we weren't reading the same book. I feel like that's the thing about Holly Black is everything that she writes is important. Like you need to pay attention to even the small little details because they do come up later and they do foreshadow things. And obviously when you first sit down and you're reading a fantasy series and you're learning about the world and the characters, there's a lot going on. It's a lot being thrown at you. So initially I didn't pick up on a lot of the foreshadowing and a lot of the little elements that she particularly placed in the beginning of the book. But now that I'm rereading it, I'm really fully getting it all. And I'm like, Wow. I did not think I could appreciate Holly Black's writing more, but I am even more so in my reread. And probably like the last thing that people say negatively about this series is that there wasn't enough romance, which I just kind of blame book talk for promoting this as a enemies to lovers romance series, because in reality, it's not. It's more about Jude fighting for power and the political intrigue and the manipulation and the psychology of all these people just trying to outvest each other. And the romance is a subplot. And I feel like that's not stressed enough. So even though you're watching this video, if you still plan to read this series and you haven't yet, 
I just want to reiterate and like make it super clear that this is not a fantasy romance. That is not the genre. Romance is not at the forefront of these books. It is much more based on the actual plot, but the romance subplot is just so well done. I honestly, as I am getting more and more into reading, I really am starting to appreciate a romance subplot more than like a full forced romance book because it just hits different. I love just getting little crumbs of the romance and slowly watching it build over books and books and books rather than so much happening all at once, you know? I don't know. Basically, just as I'm rereading this, I'm really further cementing my belief that I have yet to find a valid critique of this book. And obviously if people don't like Cardin, they think he's too mean or they don't like Jude or they want more of a romance, that's fine. Like everyone's entitled to those opinions. And I guess you could argue that all a personal opinion is a valid critique of a book, but I don't know. I just love this series and I have yet to find a single flaw with it and I can't see how anyone could change my mind. It's just so fucking brilliant. Basically, plot-wise, what's happened thus far is Jude was planning on fighting in the tournament and she wants to put on the green sash to be considered for potential knighthood. And we've just had the conversation with Maddox where he's basically like, while your bladesmanship is excellent and you're super good with your sword, I don't think you have it in you to like kill people. I just don't think morally that you could be a knight. So I'm not gonna let you put on the sash for the tournament. And obviously Jude is like super heartbroken about this. And I feel like that moment when Maddox is like, you're not a killer, morally like you are not that person. That's really what like snaps Jude in half. And that really makes her reevaluate. And I feel like that's the turning point to where she's like, you know what, bitch? Maybe I am a killer. And then she becomes one. And I love a murderous woman, so you know I stand. Let's have a toast to the incompetence of our enemies. So we're about to head to the tournament, which actually ends up being a pretty insignificant part of the story from what I remember, which is funny because on the back of the book, like the synopsis, it basically, alludes that to win a place in the court, Jude must defy Cardin and face the consequences like in this tournament, like to become a knight. But it's kind of funny that within the first 50 pages of the book, Holly Black's like, JK, I lied, bitch. That's not what's gonna happen. <laughs> Jude's not gonna become a knight through this tournament, honey. She's gonna do something entirely different. I loved that twist because I was like, what? I was not expecting this. This book just does everything that I like. I just enjoy every aspect of it. I really do. I appreciate all of the choices that Holly Black made when writing it. And it's just, <sighs> I need to stop. I need to get back to actually annotating and reading because we have a lot to get done. It is currently the 28th and The Stolen Air comes out on the 3rd. So I have less than a week. I'm gonna get back to annotating and I will talk to you when I made more progress. We just got to the scene where Cardin and his friends push Jude and Taryn into the river. And immediately Jude's first thought is how she's gonna get Taryn out of this, how to save Taryn from drowning. But then not even a page later, Cardin is like, as long as you don't defend your sister by word or deed, I won't hold you accountable for her defiance. But only if you come to us now and leave her there to drown, show her that she will always be alone. And Taryn immediately just fucking does it and just abandons Jude, which is like the number one main I fucking hate Taryn moment in this entire series. Fuck that. But then right after that, while Taryn is kissing Cardin on the cheeks, he is sitting there staring at Jude. And that is because, my friends, he is pretending that Taryn is Jude! And that Jude is the one kissing him on the cheek! The way I go feral, feral, for the little sneaky things that Cardin does throughout the story that if you don't pay attention to, like you might just miss. Okay, I'm at the part where Vivi takes Taryn and Jude to the mall because she's gonna introduce them to Heather and Vivi's trying to convince Jude and Taryn to move back to the mortal world with her and Heather. And Jude is basically saying that she doesn't really want to do that. She'd rather stay in fairy. It's pretty much all that they really know. And Jude thinks to herself, one sentence that I feel like just defines Jude and describes her as a character so perfectly. And that sentence is, maybe growing up the way we have, bad things feel good to us. That is Jude's character. I know his is big. I know it, I know it's big. I am interrupting my reading for a very, very special unboxing. I think I ordered this in September, I want to say. So it's been months, okay? It was supposed to ship at the end of November. And the day that I'm opening it, the day I'm filming, it is December 30th. So it's here and I'm gonna unbox it for you. And I am so excited. <laughs> oh my God. 
This is actually like probably the prettiest thing I've ever seen in my life. I can't. Okay, this is the Folk of the Air exclusive box set from Lit Joy Crate. I can't, I have no words. Stop, it's so beautiful. First of all, like the actual box set itself is stunning with the gold foiling. It's like a nice hard material, you know? And then obviously the books are stunning. We have The Cruel Prince, The Wicked King, Queen of Nothing, and the novella, How the King of Elfheim Learned to Hate Stories. So is this my third set of these books? Yes, yes it is. Okay, here's the first book. It is so gorgeous. Like, bitch, this is my prized possession. <gasps> Look at the freaking, oh! Valerian, rat, lock, rat. Nicasia, a minute sleigh. But Cardin, Cardin's looking fabulous. They are all signed. They have the gold foiling on the edges, like a Bible, bitch, this is my Bible. And honestly, the main reason why I caved and bought this set is because as you read, Holly Black has annotated. Like, I have annotated versions of the series. Like, I feel like Holly Black annotated this for me and me alone. <laughs> Phenomenal. Iconic. I'm so excited to flip through and read all these annotations because, oh my god, and the artwork in the book as well. Stop. In my current reread, I actually just read this scene. Look, it's Taryn and Jude in the river. The Wicked King. Oh my gosh. This might be my favorite of the covers. I've seen two of them. I don't know why I'm getting ahead of myself. By Panic. I just, are you joking? <gasps> I love this artwork of them playing cards. Not him putting the ring on her finger, I'm gonna throw up. This book is full of pain and suffering, but I'm excited to reread. The Queen of Nothing. Okay, no, I lied. I lied, this is the best one. I know all I do is say wow, but <gasps> look at them in the human realm eating pizza. Um, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Jude fighting Grimma Mog. I stan Grimma Mog though. I'm a Grimma Mog stan account. Bitch. B-I-T-C-H. Bitch, how could you do this to me? How could you do this to me? Oh, gorgeous. Oh, oh, beautiful. The colors, this is stunning. Like, I want this on my wall. But they're all so beautiful. They did such a good job with the art. Lastly, I'm actually very interested to see how the King of Elfheim Learned Hate Stories. <gasps> These are progress. So it's showing, like, the art that we have throughout the other books, but like early sketches, like, oh my gosh, you can see there's the early sketch there and then the final product at the bottom. Wow. And Holly like gives her thoughts and opinions on all the art and like writes little notes about them and what she likes about them. As a kid, my mother was a painter and my best friend growing up was an artist. I married another painter, so I have been surrounded by art and artists my whole life. I so appreciate seeing all the art for these special editions as well as I know the characters. I feel like I saw a new aspect of them in the work done for this project. I can try hard to get at a feeling that an artist can capture with a moment's glance. That's so cute. I am broke, but I am happy. Okay, and that's what truly matters. Wow, there's my unboxing. Okay, I haven't made much progress, but we are now on chapter 10, and at the end of chapter nine is when we start to kind of get glimpses into the quote-unquote love triangle that's in this book. If you know the actual end of the story, uh, which is just a spoiler review, so I'm just gonna talk about it. Obviously, Locke is not trustworthy. Fuck Locke, fuck that little rat, okay? But I will say that the first time I read this story, I really was kind of liking the interactions between Locke and Jude. I knew there was a red flag, like I knew something bad was gonna happen. I knew something was suspicious with Taryn and everything, but it wasn't what I was expecting. Initially, I really thought that Taryn's involvement and the reason why she was crying with Cardin at the beginning of the book was because 
Taryn had like fallen in love with Carden or whatever. So that's kind of what I thought was gonna happen. But then obviously we learned that Taryn is in love with Locke and Taryn knew that Locke was gonna like be flirting with Jude. See, I still don't even understand. Like this is why I have an I fucking hate Taryn tab because I just don't understand the logic of Taryn. <sighs> like obviously Locke's a piece of shit, but to me, Locke didn't owe Jude anything. Jude's twin sister definitely did owe her something. Like, come on, bitch, that's your sister. Fuck you, first of all, but whatever. Anyway, it's just funny, the contrast, because the first time I read this, I was kind of like, oh my God, wait, like Locke, I kind of like him though. And now that I'm reading it the second time, I'm not even annotating or highlighting or tabbing any of the parts between Jude and Locke because I literally don't care about that rat. And I'm glad Taryn kills him in the third book. Ah! Or is it the second? See, I don't even remember. Anyway. Okay, so we are now at the scene where Valerian tries to choke Jude to death with a piece of fairy fruit. As Valerian is like shoving this fairy fruit in Jude's mouth and she is choking on it, Cardin just shoves him right off and is like, enough, which is iconic. Stop. Oh my god. But now Nikasia is really mad because I think Nikasia's starting to like understand that Jude is getting under Cardin's skin, that Cardin kind of, you know, is intrigued by her, and Nikasia and Cardin are kind of like a thing. So Nikasia is feeling territorial and angry. And so now she is trying to just completely embarrass Jude as much as she can. She made Jude get naked and stripped down. And so Jude like takes off her gown, but underneath she's wearing like mortal underwear, which like normally the fairies do not wear. So she's wearing this like mint green polka dot bra and underwear. And now she's like crawling around. And I've heard people complain about this scene that like it's just taken way too far, that like Cardin is awful. And like, how could you ever redeem yourself from this? But as I'm rereading this scene, Cardin hasn't done any of it. It's all Nikasia and Valerian. And actually Cardin is the one that eventually is like, no, Jude's not gonna lick your hands clean. Jude's not gonna do anything to you, Nikasia. Instead, Jude's gonna come to me and kiss my foot. He's doing two things at once here. And some people might think that he's just being evil and he's like playing into this joke. When in reality, part of it is that he wants everyone around him to still respect him and remind Valerian and Acacia that he's the one in charge, he's the prince, he gets to be the one that decides what happens to Jude, not anyone else. But on the flip side of that, he's also trying to stop Nikasia from doing something too bad to Jude because he knows deep down he would never do anything too terrible. He would never like kill her, he would never do anything irreplaceable because he's has feelings for her, which he's kind of trying to deny, but whatever. So he's trying to save Jude from Nikasia, but at the same time, like keep up with his sort of status and not let other people realize that he's saving her. Also like he just low key wants to hear Jude say nice things to him. <laughs> This is peak enemies to lovers. I'm sorry if you don't understand the subtlety underneath all of Cardin's actions throughout this entire book. I don't know what to tell you. I don't understand how people are like this book doesn't have enough romance. Like there was no romance in this book. I'm sorry. This is romance. I just can't get over the underwear. Like out of all the different underwear, I want to know why Holly Black decided on mint green polka dot underwear. I just want to know. I do feel very bad for Jude in this scene, but it's just iconic. It's iconic. I love you, Holly Black. I got to Jude's first murder scene where she kills Valerian by stabbing him in the heart. If I cannot be better than them, I will become so much worse. <laughs> Initially, I was attempting to get to page 247 by the end of the night, so I'm about 20 pages short, but it is nearly midnight and I am getting quite sleepy, so I think I'm going to call it a night. We definitely made a lot of progress today. The tabs are tabbing. They are looking stunning, and I think I'll be able to definitely finish this tomorrow, and then the next day, we'll start reading The Stolen Air. Loving this book so much. This reread has been so wonderful. I truly feel like you can't really fully understand the complexities and the amazing writing quality of a book like in its full potential unless you've read it more than once because reading it after you know what's going to happen 
and being able to pick up on all the foreshadowing and the nuances in the writing like even more so it's just it's a beautiful experience i'm having such a fun time it's such a cool way to learn about writing and to really like analyze a book's writing and i love it so i'm gonna get some sleep bye <laughs> currently 10 p.m. I'm exhausted but I am happy to report that I have finished rereading and annotating The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. Look at those tabs. I am obsessed. It was so much work. It was so much more effort than I thought it would be like and actually the amount of time it took to read the book like it took so much longer than I thought it would take but I am so happy that I did it. I feel like it was the perfect little warm-up to prepare me for the stolen air tomorrow. Five stars. I mean, if we're being honest, like 15 stars. Like I loved it even more the second time around because I got to really appreciate the quality of the writing and the setups and the payoffs and the foreshadowing and the character development. And it just really, really solidified it that much more as one of my favorite books. And I cannot wait to eventually do the same thing for the Wicked King, the Queen of Nothing. And then they'll all be able to go on my shelves all tabbed up and annotated. I think I'm gonna have to do these ones at a slower pace, kind of just take my time. But it's definitely something that I want to do at some point. It's just so beautiful, like I can't stop like flipping through it. I love it. Okay, well, I will talk to you all in the morning. Tomorrow's the day, we're gonna find out. I will see you then, good night. Stolen air day. We are here. It is early in the fucking morning. I rolled out of bed, threw on some clothes, got in the car. Here's the thing. I pre-ordered the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition of The Stolen Air when it was released back in June of 2021. This is only like my third time pre-ordering a book, okay? And the first two times I did it, I did it through Amazon. And when I pre-order through Amazon, it has always arrived day of. I've learned my lesson. Do not pre-order from Barnes & Noble. They will not even ship my book until today, which means it's not gonna get here for at least a week and I just we can't have that they have copies of the exclusive edition in stock at my Barnes & Noble online is what it said so I'm just here and I'm gonna buy myself a physical copy and then I'll just return the pre-ordered one when it arrives you know I'm so excited to go in and see the book and just have it in my hands and I am on the verge of tears I can just like feel them welling up behind my eyes you know like I'm trying to bite it back I'm gonna stop talking I'm gonna go get my book and then we can talk. Okay, I'll be back. There's like no one here. It's 
fabulous. It's so quiet. It's so cozy. I am looking, my eyes are open. <gasps> I did it. I'm truly living my best life. I am going to lose my mind, I think. I'm actually, I'm actually gonna lose my mind. <gasps> How fucking adorable. Oh, I love the blue. The blue is so pretty. I think we should read the first sentence and then we can keep reading when I get home. <laughs> I'm sorry, I literally, All I've seen is the map, and I'm, I'm like, I need to get myself together. <laughs> a passerby discovered a toddler sitting on the chilly concrete of an alley, playing with the wrapper of a cat food container. I love cats. I also love Cardin Green Briar, and who else was raised on cat milk? By the time she was brought to the hospital, her limbs were blue with cold. She was a wizened little thing, too thin, made of sticks. She only knew one word, her name, Wren. I'm not emotionally ready for this. I'm not emotionally ready. See you when we get home. As a child, Ren read lots of fairy tales. That's why when the monsters came, she knew it was because she had been wicked. Bitch! I can't. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> it's not funny. So we are following the same structure that we had in The Cool Prince where the prologue is in third person and it's talking about the main character's backstory. In The Cool Prince, obviously it was Jude and it was when Maddox came and murdered her parents. And then in this one, it's Ren being taken from her adopted family. And then once you get to chapter one, it goes into first person. And we have gorgeous chapter headings. As usual, I love the chapter headings in these books. I also love this cute little animal <laughs> by the page numbers. I actually don't know like what that is. If that's a cat, if that's a mouse, if that's a fucking like raccoon, bitch, I don't know, but it's cute. Ignore the jazz music in the background. I put on one of those like coffee shop ambiance videos, but I'm on page 50 and oh my gosh, I am sitting here giggling and blushing and just having the best time. These scenes of them when they were young and they were kids, it's like, so heartwarming. I love it so much. They're gonna play Sorry right now, the board game. And it's, oh, it's just so adorable. Okay, I just reached chapter six, page 105. Not much has changed in terms of how I'm feeling. I'm just, I'm having, I'm having a great time. I'm loving Oak and Ren's interactions. I am intrigued to see like what's gonna happen in the plot. Like if I know Holly Black, this is gonna end with some crazy cliffhanger. And then I'm gonna have to wait like a year at least for the next book, which is painful. But uh, one of the other characters that we're following is like warning Ren. And it's like, Oak's probably a love talker. Like you need to be careful. You need to be careful of him. Like don't trust him, don't trust him. But I wanna trust him. Like I, I'm easily influenced and manipulated by characters who say pretty things and it's happening again. <laughs> Hello, reading vlog. So it is actually a few days later. I hadn't been able to get much reading done the past two days because I have been working. Work has started up for the new year, so I'm back to like filming and editing a bunch, but I did manage to get to page 299, chapter 15. So we have 50 pages left and I'm going to finish it right now. I am cuddled up on the couch in my udi, just pure coziness and um, we're gonna finish it. I know two people who have finished this book and they say that it ends on a wild, wild ending. So I thought I would record myself as I read like the final few chapters so you can see my reactions, but I'm not gonna spoil anything. 
obviously. This is not a spoiler because I'm not gonna be specific about it, but Lady Noor's necklace giving me very much Amarantha from A Court of Thorns and Roses, if you know what I mean. <laughs> oh God, I love Oak. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> oh god. Mm. Oh, that is rough. Oh my god. That's kind of making me nauseous. Yes! Go off! Yes! 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 <laughs> Got him! <laughs> Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god! <laughs> oh my god, like, Oak is hilarious. Like, he is so funny. I love him. I could have done something, applauded at the right moments, held your back. <laughs> Girl, why are you doing that? Ooh! Ooh, ooh, ooh! That paragraph is stunning, bitch. I am tabbing that. Girl, say something! Oh my god, say something right fucking now! Page 343. The plot twist is revealed, and it is exactly what I had guessed. Goddamn, sometimes it hurts having such a big fucking brain, you know? Do you want to tell them, or should I? <laughs> No! Oh, okay, no, we're fine. Oh my god, I almost shit my pants! <laughs> what the fuck? I need to get, I need to get my thoughts together. I need to mentally process what just happened. What? Hello everyone. So it has been a few days since I finished The Stolen Air, but I have collected my thoughts and I'm finally ready to talk about my feelings, my review, what I'm gonna rate it. I thought this was phenomenal. I loved it. I had a great time reading it, as you could probably tell by the reading vlog. Initially, I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit nervous that I maybe wouldn't be able to connect with Oak and Ren as much as I had connected with Jude and Carden. And I've read other books by Holly Black outside of Elfheim, like outside of her fairy novels, like Coldest Girl in Cold Town, Book of Night. And while I liked those characters, none of them were as riveting and enjoyable as Jude and Carden. And so I was just worried that maybe that would be the case with these two characters as well. But I absolutely was wrong. I loved Oak and Ren so much. Oak is my fox eyed beloved, but we definitely learned that he has quite a bit of like a masochistic dark side, which I'm very excited to hopefully get more of and explore further in the next book. Oak also made me laugh out loud. Like he was so funny. I could not stop laughing at his like little witty jokes and like one liners, like he's hilarious. And then of course, Ren. Ren was a rabid and feral, but like in the best way possible. I loved how she just kept biting people. <laughs> I was like, yes, keep biting people, woo. And I do love how as the story progressed, she really like came into her own power and decided that she was not gonna let herself like get stomped on anymore and she was gonna do what she needed to do. And I just, I really loved her. I love a powerful woman. We already know this. Thank you, Jude. And while Ren is very different than Jude, they are both just powerful women who do whatever the fuck they wanna do. And that's what I love to read about. So I also loved the interactions with them when they were younger, like the flashback scenes of them becoming friends and like their initial relationship, which we had glimpses of in the Folk of the Air trilogy. But in this book, we really got to like see it from their perspective. And that was like so cute. I thought the plot was really good. The road trip aspect was really fun. You get to see so many different like courts and places outside of just Elfheim. And I really liked that. I liked, you know, all the different lore with the side characters. I just had an amazing time. I feel like this book did a super good job being the first in a duology at setting up all of these, you know, plot lines and this political tension and it's just it did a great job at setting up for 
I believe, like the shit show that's gonna go down in the second book. So that was really great. I'm scared, I'm excited, but I'm hopeful and just impatiently waiting for book two. I'm gonna be giving this a 4.75 stars. The only reason it is not a five star right now is because I did guess the big twist, as you saw. Uh, obviously I'm not gonna spoil what that is. I'm not gonna spoil any of the actual like plot points in the book, but I did guess it. And I don't know if that's just because like I'm a genius or if it was like an easy thing to guess. I'm not sure. I asked a few people that have read it and finished it and they said that they wouldn't have guessed it. So I don't know, but I did guess it. So I'm gonna dock 0.25 stars for that. But also that rating could easily be changed into a five. Kind of similar with how I rated Legendborn, I feel like, I feel like when I read a series, whether it's a trilogy or a duology, I have trouble rating each book individually. And usually I can't really tell how I felt about each book until I finish the entire thing. Like for example, with the Folk of the Air trilogy, initially the Wicked King, I think I gave a four star instead of a five. But then after I finished the entire trilogy and saw it all together, I was like, oh no, like they're all a million stars. I loved everything about them. So right now it's a 4.75 stars, but there is a very high likelihood that when the second book comes out and I read it, this will also get bumped up to like a five, you know, like it, it could happen. Absolutely loved it. I'm, it was just, oh, it was so good. Highly recommend if you read the original trilogy, read this one. Like you will enjoy it. You will enjoy it. I also felt like this one had a bit more romance. It still was definitely a subplot. Uh, but you just got a lot more like little romantic moments than you did between like Jude and Carden in their books, you know? So I really like that, you know, I'm, I'm a slut for romance. And if you haven't read any of these books, I would definitely recommend reading the initial Folk of the Air trilogy first before jumping into this. Like you don't have to, it does kind of like sum up and kind of recap things that happened in this series, but like you should just read this series first and then read, like just, just go in order. Now, you might be thinking, is this vlog over? No, it is not. I'm actually just about to head out and leave for something super exciting. Holly Black is actually doing a book signing in my city tonight and I have tickets. My sibling Gio and I are going together. Your ticket comes with a signed copy of The Stolen Air, so I will have it in the Barnes & Noble exclusive and then the regular edition, which is fine with me. But as for my personal books that I'm bringing, it is very tempting for me to bring every single Holly Black book that I have on my shelf that isn't signed because I actually do have a few signed books from her already, but I decided I'm just going to keep it simple and I'm going to bring my initial Folk of the Air paperbacks, including my annotated one. I was hoping to have all three of these annotated by the time I got them signed, but I ran out of time, so that's fine. Um, but yeah, I wanted to bring my initial copies so that eventually all three of these will be nice and annotated and signed and they'll just be like my little prized possession. So I'm gonna bring these to get signed. Maybe I'll be able to like take a picture or like some little videos. I don't, I'm not sure if they'll actually let us like take a photo or a video like with her, but either way, I'll try to get some little glimpses and uh, some stuff for the vlog so you guys can kind of see what's going on. It's kind of funny because the event's actually being held in a church because the bookshop that's holding it is like too small to host everyone. So we're going to like a random church, which I think is so, that's like, that's like the most Utah thing ever. Like, yeah. Okay, I will talk to you once Gio gets here and we head to the signing. Someone's in a carbon cosplay up there. It's very cool. But his words gave me a strange, sharp pain in my chest. After a moment, I recognized it as envy for having sisters, for having stories. Okay, we're here at the signing. She just did like the big old interview and now we're just waiting to go up and get our book signed. She told us that the second book after Stolen Air is called The Prisoner's Throne. So that's exciting. And Gio's looking through my annotations currently, so. Okay, hello everyone. I am back home from the signing and it 
was amazing. She did like a Q&A, she read a chapter from the book, which was amazing. Someone in the crowd asked her who Cardin's number one top artist on Spotify would be, which I thought was fucking hilarious. Uh, she just replied, I assume you would like murder battles. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, overall, it was a great time. I got all of my books signed, including my annotated one, personalized. She wrote my name. I feel like I was so awkward. It's like I had so many things I wanted to say to her and then right as I got up and I started talking to her, my mind went blank. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to take photos ourselves, but they let us give our phone to like one of the workers and they took photos and the guy that took the photos <laughs> for me did an awful job. Like I did not get a single good photo with her, but that's okay. Uh, my sibling Gio also took a video of us, so that's cool. But I mean, I'm just still happy I got to go, happy I got to get my book signed, and happy to close out today's vlog with that. I feel like that's a, that's a great way to end it. I met Holly Black, I read The Stolen Air, I reread The Cool Prince. It's been quite a journey, but thank you all for coming with me and just nerding out with me a little bit over my favorite books, my favorite author, it has been such a fun week, so I'm glad I got to bring you along. If you liked this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that fun YouTube stuff, and I will talk to you all in my next video very, very soon. I'm sending you lots of love and light, and I hope you have a great day or a great night. Okay, bye.